Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to Read Between the Lines. 2014, it's already done, but what a year it was for sports fans. This week, it's an all RBTL panel as the boys come back, and we're talking heroes, zeros, pretenders, contenders, and some of the biggest storylines that made the news in 2014. Also, on this week, I face off against Stefan Petri, the very polarizing MMA promoter. It's happening right here, right now. You know what time it is. It's time to Read Between the Lines. This week's Four Downs is brought to you by Elite Sports Tours as we recap the year that was 2014. We invite you as always to join us on our social networks to have your say and share your opinion. We welcome an all RBTL panel. The boys are back for the very first time. Great to see you, David Hurley, RBTL contributor. Glad to be back. To your right is Pierre Evans Just. Good to see you. Glad to be back. And to my left, our soccer insider, RBTL contributor, Anthony Cornelius. New Great chair, new year. All right, 2014, you talk about a new year. Last year was quite the year. A lot of ups, lots of downs. Uh, but you talk look, you take a look at some of the most outstanding dominant performances that teams have had. It's been a crazy year for dominance. Any one in particular stand out for you? Oh, Super Bowl last year when you look at the Denver Broncos beating or getting beat by the Seattle Seahawks 43 to 8. Uh, Peyton Manning having a hard time in New York like that. That was a great performance. It, it shows all around defense and it really, really was a great team performance. And you've been pretty hard on Peyton Manning with regards to the big game. So yeah. is that one of the reasons why you went with <laughs> well, that? Well, no, or? it's actually just the way that they did the whole playoff run. I mean, the fact they beat San Francisco at home the way they did. And then to go and beat Denver the way that they bid in, in, in New York, that was incredible. And it was really a total team performance. Can they it do was, it again real quick? I, I hope that they do. Yeah, I think they will. Pierre. Not, I'm not convinced. <laughs> I'm not convinced about that. For me, it was the San Antonio Spurs, uh, a team that suffered the kind of defeat they did the year before. Coming back, guys are older, so you're wondering if they're on their last legs. And coming in into the series, people expected Miami to 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 beat them again and to go through that series and dominate them by a record margin in terms of point differential, in terms of of uh, scoring. For me, it was the 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 most. Uh, not only the most important performance of the year, but it was the most uh, memorable because of the guys there. Fifth championship for Greg Popovich and Tim Duncan and, and Tony the Parker. They beat the Heat too. And they, they, they beat them down and, and, yeah. and basically got LeBron to move back to Cleveland. And for me, that was... Uh, it was probably the most memorable. There's no doubt that Greg Popovich has this team uh, aspect going on. It's incredible yeah. to see how the Spurs buy into it. I mean, they truly are a team. Yeah, they're the not best organization in sports. Exactly. They're not a team me. of superstars, yeah. more of a superstar team. You see that all the time. You yeah. use that expression. I use that quite quite often. But that team really represented. Uh, yeah. Can they go all the way again this year, do you think, 2015? Yeah, I believe they can. Uh, they have the, the personnel to do so. Guys just have to be healthy. But a year older, though. Yeah, yeah they're a year, a year older, older. But Kawhi, and Kawhi Leonard, conference. MVP last year in the playoffs, he's an, a year older with more experience. And Tim Duncan is still at the top of his game, and Tony Parker is still at the top of his game. Manu Ginobili, they, they have the possibilities to do it. I think. Uh, before I start, I'm going to go with the old saying, a game of football is 90 minutes, and in the end, the Germans always win. Uh, the Germans became the first. I'd uh, like to know who that comes pretty, from. That's it's an old, German it's from your it's group. A, it's, an old, it's an old British saying, actually, but uh, uh, the first European team to win a World Cup on that side of the, uh, the, that side of the board, South America, North yeah. America, they went in uh, in Brazil. They dismantled Brazil in the semifinal 7-1 that, that brought yeah. 200 million Brazilians to tears. Maybe a few suicides. We don't know. And uh, they went not. through France and Messi's Argentina in the final. So any team that beats France, Brazil, and Argentina on the way to a World Cup final deserves it. They had five players on the All-11 team. Mueller won uh, Golden Gloves. Mueller, Silver Ball, was runner-up to the Golden Shoot. And uh, they just... They just dominated the tournaments. Yeah. Uh, boring, controlled, robotic that soccer. That seven-one beatdown. But they were yeah. semifinal. That was unprecedented. Was just in, yeah. Unbelievable. They were dominant. I don't. I don't think any team can ever manhandle Brazil like that. Uh, yeah, if it wasn't for the Germans to do that, and I don't think we'll ever see a game like that again. Let alone. I mean, Brazil. it was over in twenty minutes. It was yeah. five nothing yeah. in yeah. twenty yeah. minutes. So that it was, was really fantastic. Cool. So, <laughs> it, I celebrated every goal like it was a World Cup for me, <laughs> and you know I'm Italian. And I, I bet you weren't the only one times. in the country that did that. I'm gonna go with the LA Kings. Uh, seeing what they did in the playoffs was unbelievable. Uh, Twenty six games played in the postseason, six elim uh, six elimination games, uh, even doing it against Chicago in Game Seven, uh, courtesy of Martinez. A great performance once again by the L LA Kings, and again being able to showcase that they can go the distance, that they love a 
under the, being under the pressure. And two out of three for a market that really needed. They were the laughing stock for the uh, organization for the NHL for many years. Finally, they're back to their win. And how they it's beat great San to see Jose? It was unbelievable. Down yeah. three games to none. Yeah. Come back to win the series for Chicago three. as well. That was yeah. this basically the final stay with us after the break uh, gentlemen i want to change uh, gears a little bit i want to talk to you guys a little about your individual performer of the year i know we didn't have a chance to touch on but well, we will and we're also going to talk about your heroes and zeros stay with us all that and more all right here on read between the lines Welcome back to Read Between the Lines as we continue our recap of the year 2014, the year that was an incredible season for sports. We welcome back an all-RBTL panel, David Hurley, Pierre Evans, Justin, Anthony Cornelia. Great to see you, gentlemen. All right, we talked about right before break the most outstanding team performance. Any individual performances stood out to you? Cristiano Ronaldo. Uh, already in this calendar year, he's got over 30 goals in 25 games. He's doubled anybody under him right now in the Liga. Last year, he finished as UEFA Player of the Year. Liga top scorer, Champions League top scorer. Uh, he ran away with a Ballon d'Or, becoming one of the players to win Ballon d'Or with two different teams, Man U and Real. Uh, as a team, Real Madrid won everything across the board. There's no, no better player than Cristiano Ronaldo in 2014. For me, I'm going to, into Anthony's area of expertise. I'm going to with Howard. That's because you have the same beard. Yeah, we look, <laughs> we look like I could pass for him. Uh, making 16 saves in a round of 16 against uh, Belgium. That was huge. Most saves since 1966. Uh, literally, he he kept he kept the, the U.S. in the game, and for me, that was the most memorable single game performance of the year. Well, my memorable performance will have to go to uh, a guy who played for the Montreal Canadiens, who was non-existent during the regular season, and Rene Bork. Uh, coming out the way he did in the playoffs was fantastic. He came out, he started scoring goals, where we were all on our butts in the stands, freaking out, thinking, "How is he doing this? Since he's only scored six goals in the regular yeah. season." It was a great performance. He helped Montreal Canadiens to an Easter Conference uh, game. I'm going to go with Madison Bumgarner. Uh, not mm, only the choice. best performance of the year, yeah. but the best performance yeah. a pitcher has ever had in the history of baseball. Yeah. 0.25 uh, ERA, ERA in his career with regards to the World Series. He pitched 52.2 innings. Unbelievable performance by Madison Bumgarner. And when you consider he's got three rings... And he's yeah. 25 years old. And, three World and he's just getting win. started. That's yeah, so it's that's... unbelievable. Uh, we talked about, obviously, uh, these guys being heroes. But there was a couple of zeros throughout the Older, year as well. Anybody stand out for, uh, you know, the worst performance or maybe the zero of the year for you? Uh, zero of the year for me is, is, is definitely going to be Jose Mourinho. And this is why I'm saying this. Wow, I wow. Think that's on the box. Yeah, yeah. The box. He, he's, he came into Chelsea and he was supposed to win the Premiership. He missed out on that one. And he was supposed to win... Uh, in the, the UEFA Championship, and he didn't win there. So Jose Mourinho has failed for Ibramovic, and I think he'll do it. He'll fail again in 2015. You agree with that, Anthony? Uh, it's it's tough to agree with that because I don't want to create a lot of haters. I've already done that when I <laughs> hated on Messi. But uh, <laughs> real quick, like Dave said, to go up against PSG, Mourinho might put all his eggs in one basket and come out with nothing this year. Do you have a zero in uh, soccer as well, or I, I'm going with Brazil. Hosting the World Cup, promising to 200 million people with all the economic crisis. There was protests in Brazil. They didn't want to host the World Cup. Brazil went in and lost 7-1 to Germany. You know, they got off to a start against Croatia where he got that questionable penalty. And yeah. they didn't perform. That Samba, Jogo Bonito wasn't there. <laughs> Zero. For me, it's uh, not that he was ever a hero, but for me, it's Donald Sterling. Uh, the, the, the shadow that he cast over the NBA really... It put a damp on the playoffs when they were a great playoffs last year. For me, he was definitely a, a guy that had to be removed and that definitely uh, could have it could have been much worse. Uh, obviously, he got removed very fast, but for me, he was definitely the, the zero of the year. I got to go with Tiger Woods. Uh, tough year for Tiger Woods. Leave Tiger alone, uh, man. You know, not, that, not, that it, not that he was ever a zero, <laughs> yeah. right? I still consider him a great impact player with probably regards to ever. golf. And obviously, probably, yeah, absolutely, the greatest ever. But this specific year, if we look back at 2014, it was a tough year for Tiger Woods. It was uh, he had yeah. his worst finish in an Open ever. Uh, missing cuts. Missed not cuts, doing. Yeah. yeah, he's not doing well. And I think that this... This whole situation with Tiger Woods has impacted him a lot more than we think. That we'd like to think well. psychologically, yeah. big time, and yeah. we're now starting to see the long-term aspect. Everybody kind of brushed it off and says Tiger will be back. Tiger will be back. Now you get to understand how competitive golf is. Now you really? get to understand how competitive it is for yeah. guys like Tiger to repeat. But at the same time, the flip side of that is it creates an incredible um, look back at what he's been able to accomplish now that you see yeah. how hard it is for him to yeah, win. Exactly. Sure, exactly. So gentlemen, stay right there because I want to look forward to the year 2015 as we talk about our pretenders or contenders. You don't want to miss that. Stay right there. All that more happening right here. You know what it is. Let's read between the lines.
Welcome back to Read Between the Lines as we look forward to the year 2015, a huge year in sports for us fans. We invite you, as always, to give us your opinion, share your thoughts, and tweet us. Welcome back on RBTL full panel this week with David Hurley, Pierre Evans Just, and Anthony Cornelli. Gentlemen, I will start with my pretender and contender. I will start with a contender, and that would be the Toronto Raptors. I think the Raptors have shown through the course of a little bit more than a quarter of the season that they have not only the depth, but they have the guys off the bench who can get it done. Um, the Eastern Conference, the nucleus of a lot of these teams are not the same. I think they've got a nucleus that's tight. I think coaching is doing well. I think that the vibe in Toronto is well. The fans are engaged on it. On the flip side, uh, my pretender would be the Golden State Warriors, believe it or not. Wow. Yeah, I, 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 no I'm going to yeah. get a lot of flack. Yeah. The idea behind the Golden State Warriors is there's no doubt that they've had a historic start in their season. And they're a deep team and potential an MVP candidate yes. on that team as well. Yeah. The question is, with a stacked Western Conference and with the, the grind of a long playoff run, can they sustain that? Yeah. They're a young team. They're an inexperienced team. I think this year is all about learning. Next year, they'll be the big threat. Hmm. That's, That's a good one. I'm going with my contender. I got to make a couple of my old friends happy with this. I'm going with my old guard, Juventus, uh, in 2015, with a couple of big signings yeah. in the transfer market. I think we got a favorable draw in the Champions League with Borussia, that they're struggling in the German League. If we can get through Borussia and pick up maybe the winner of Basel, Porto, yeah, Porto yeah. we got a semifinal in the Champions League. We're going to run away with our fourth title in a row in Italy, and we got a favorable draw in the Coppa Italia. So hopefully we'll be the first team to put a silver star for a 10th Coppa Italia and have our three stars for our 32 I love, championships. I love how you say we. Yes, I I'm we. It. I'm part of it. I'm black, I, and I'm black pretender? and white. My pretender, I'm have to go with Mr. Falcao of Ooh. Manchester United. I think when he didn't get to go to Real Madrid, he's a little baby, signed for the second biggest team in world football. He's coming into his own, but he'll be out of he'll be out of Man U in a couple of years, and people are gonna say, you know what, he should have stayed I'll in Madrid. We'll take him for a couple of years. Don't worry about that. Here. <laughs> Uh, for myself, my contender is, and my pretender are the same person. For me, it's Adonis Stevenson. It, it, it was a no-brainer. Uh, a lot of talk in the last couple of weeks, especially leading up to the fight. And he, he did great. Knocked out a guy that he was supposed to knock out. It was, it was a mere formality. But as a champion, it's very seldom in boxing history that the guy that's looked at as the champion, the lineal champion, is is not recognized as such by the masses. And for Adonis Stevenson, it's the only reason why is he hasn't fought the best guys in, in his division. Now, he, he, he does have a prime opportunity to fight either the winner the winner of uh, Pascal uh, Kovalev. And he not only does he have to fight that guy, but he has to look great because it's a, it's a, it's a make it or break it year. He's yeah. closer to 40 than he is to 30, and uh, he has to deliver. Well, I'm going to go with my contender of the year. My contender of the year is going to be David De Gea. Uh, what he's done at Manchester United is being the youngest goalkeeper, and he's going to be one of the world's best. He's going to be beat Neuer as being uh, the best goaltender in the world, I think, in the next year. Uh, I think 2015 will be a big year for Manchester United. They'll have to climb back into the top four, get back into the Champions League. So we'll see some, some nice things. And my pretender of the year goes to a man who shafted the Oakland Raiders in Jim Harbaugh. Uh, have fun in Michigan. You're not going to win. You're going to have a hard time in the Big Ten. You're going to lose to Urban Meyer in Ohio State year in, year out, like the tradition goes for Michigan. So thank you for shafting, uh, for shafting Oakland, but, but, but enjoy yourself in Michigan. You're not going to win. Straight Raiders fan. That was going to say. <laughs> yeah, tell, tell, I, I'm, tell I'm a Raiders fan. Though. I'm a little bit bitter, but uh, okay. he, he's leaving the pro ranks to go to college. He's going to see it's not the same. Real quickly before we uh, go to break, is there a reason or a, a, a understatement of why this has happened? I know that you, you uh, claim maybe Why did he was, go back? It's yeah, his alma mater. He, he played there. Uh, he won his brightest team to a number two ranking when he was with Bo Schemblecker. Uh, Bo Schemblecker. Wow, it's a long name to say. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's, it's his alma mater, and then he wants to go back and he wants to revive that program and bring it into one of the top in the nation. On that note, gentlemen, it was great to see you. I uh, look forward to a great 2015. Thanks for taking the time. Thanks. Stay with us after the break. My one on one, my face off against the very polarizing Stefan Petri. You don't want to miss it. Stay with us. Hi, I'm Anthony Stevenson. You're watching Read Between the Line. He's known as one of the most successful MMA promoters that Quebec has ever seen. He's outspoken. He's the ex-manager of GSP. It's great to be able to face off against the one and only Stéphane Petri. Stéphane, welcome to the show. Thanks for taking the time. It's a pleasure. 
you're a very polarizing figure. Uh, a lot of people like you, a lot of people don't like you because of the success that you've seen in MMA. I was curious to start with the pending lawsuit that's happening in the UFC. Uh, Kung Lee, his manager, uh, his lawyer has come out and said, look, we don't like the conditions in which we're working in. Uh, first of all, do you agree with the lawsuit? And is it a very fine line that these guys are crossing right now with regards to the lawsuit in the UFC? I think guys should be careful with this whole lawsuit thing. I, I think the UFC has done a lot of good things for the fighters in the, in the, in the last few years. Well, since they bought the company, uh, they spent a lot of money to, 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 in the fighters. They spent a lot of, of money marketing-wise to get the sports to, known. But in, uh, but in all fairness, in terms of return sports, right? if you take a look at the four professional sports, the amount of return of the amount of money the organization makes back to its athletes is averaging about 50% of pro sports. In the MMA world, I mean, we're talking six, seven, eight percent. Do the fighters have have a point here to, to ask for more money? Oh, exactly. At at that point, at the the point we are in history right now, I think fighters should be making more money, obviously. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's not a, a situation where, if you compare it to boxing, I mean, Mayweather makes a lot of money. All those top guys make money, but all the other guys fighting on the undercard. So it's top heavy. Exactly. Uh, all the undercards fighters are making stupid money in boxing. Right. In MMA, the, a guy will start with the UFC, will make at least $10,000 for, for his fights. Mm -hmm. So obviously there's, there needs to be a balance where the top guys make more money. But I think that, the, I mean, we, we have to, to read between the lines. We have to be careful. I like it. I like <laughs> it. We have to be very careful with this whole situation. I think the UFC has done a tremendous, tremendous job. Yeah. Uh, I think some of the, of the fighters can make more money, but I don't think it's a situation like some media are reporting that the UFC is exaggerating on fighters. It's not at that point, but yes, you're right. At the beginning, they spent a lot of money on the sport. I think at one point, UFC was 400 million mm -hmm. under. Now they're making a lot of money, and obviously fighters should get more, but it's not as dramatic as people say. You work on both sides from a promoting standpoint. You were also an agent. Um, real quickly, where does the responsibility lie of working conditions? Is it all in the promoter? Is it all in the president of the company? Or is it also on the agent, on the fighters to say, this is what we want to fight. This is, you know, this is what we're gonna ask for to fight. But at the, end of the, at the end of the day, the control also resolves in the promoter's hand as well. So where does that responsibility lie? I'll give you the best example. I'm managing fighters in the UFC right now, but they're, they're beginning in the UFC. Mm -hmm. They're not a top star yet with, with the organization. Mm -hmm. So the agent can do much. You know, it's uh, you try to get the best deal for your fighter. You try to negotiate little things, but there's not much you can do because if you're not going to go in the UFC, where are you going to go? Right. But when you're managing a guy like GSP, back when I was managing GSP, I got George's first $1 million contract. And that was a very, very hard negotiation with the UFC. Mm -hmm. I mean, we went back and forth. We hung up on each other a few times. Uh, me, Dana, and Joe Silva, it was crazy. But at the end of the day, I got George back then a great deal. Yeah. So when you have leverage, then it's on the agent's uh, shoulder to make sure his guy gets the best deal. And Kong Lee was a top guy. I mean, probably, I think maybe his agent didn't do a good job if he's not happy. What are the, you've been a central focus and central pivotal pioneer really when you think about, about MMA in Quebec. I'm curious to understand with all this hype that boxing has right now in Quebec, you have so many stars who are coming out of Quebec in terms of boxing. Is Quebec an MMA market more than a boxing market? It's just it's been untapped? Because there were a couple of years back when you were running a couple of the organizations that you were involved with, it was seeing some huge success. I mean, TKO was drawing a few thousand, if not more, at the Bell Center, in which I, I was involved with back in the day. I remember that very clearly. Is it a boxing market or MMA market? Uh, I think it's, a, it's, not, it's not a boxing market and it's not an MMA market. I think, I think Montreal is, a, is an event market. If, you're gonna, if you bring in Montreal a big event, a big, big fight, a big, uh, uh, big names in, uh, on a card, whether it's MMA or boxing, you're going to get people. Back, back in the days with TKO, we were getting eight, 9,000 people. Yeah, yeah. I remember one night we, did, we, we took a, a former hockey enforcer, Steve Bossy, we put him against Icho Larenas, who was a champion here, and we got 9,000 people. Yeah. So I, 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 I don't think it's a question of, uh, of, of the sport. It's mo mostly a question of who's fighting on the card. And the big problem with MMA right now in Quebec is that before you get champions like they have in boxing, I mean, you need to build a Boutte, you need to build a Stevenson or a Pascal and, that and all these guys. As well. So here in Montreal, a guy will, after four or five fights, will want to go into to the UFC. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine back in the days with TKO if I would have said no to the UFC and kept St. Pierre, Hominic, Stout, Loiseau, and all these guys here? I mean, we would be the one getting 20,000 people at the Bell Center mm -hmm. under the... T 
TKO or whatever banner. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's, it's really, it's going to be very hard for MMA in Quebec because by the time you build a star and you're able they somehow, jump ship. let's say you're able somehow to keep him in Montreal. The problem is also that you have MMA on TV every uh, two or three times a, w a week. Right. You have the UFC uh, uh, reality show. Fight night. You have a UFC every weekend. Mm -hmm. You have Bellator once a week. I mean, it's crazy. Back in the days, there was no MMA on TV. There was, the, the, I mean, TKO. We had a, when when there was a TKO event at the Bell Center, it was something special. You know, now it's not special anymore. It's on TV three times a week. You know, after I I, I stopped with TKO, took a break for about two years. I came back with Instinct. We had a great first show. We had 5,000 people, but we spent a lot of money on market, marketing mm -hmm. and advertising. Sometimes so we spent, we overspent on that, but it was the first show. We wanted to get the name out there. And then after that, when we came back to normal uh, marketing budgets, we, 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 we went down from 5,000 people to 1,000 people. You right know, before we, right before we let you go, I want to have a little bit of fun with you as we uh, get into our rapid fire segment. I'll throw a couple of questions your way. You let me know uh, the first thing that comes to mind. You ready to go? I'm ready to go. All right. So which two fighters in their prime at a catch weight would you have liked to see fight? Anderson Silva, George St. Pierre. Is the UFC monopoly good for MMA worldwide? No. Will CM Punk make any splash in the UFC? He's going to get squashed. If there was one rule that you'd like removed or implemented, which one would it be? No rounds. How many seconds do I last against you in the octagon? Two minutes. <laughs> will GSP <laughs> come back? You will for one fight. And last but not least, pick one athlete from either today or the past that you would want to sit down and have a nice supper with. Vitor Belfort. Pleasure doing this, and thanks for taking the time. It was a time. pleasure. Hopefully we'll have you back. Thank you. Stay with us. My rant is up next. You don't want to miss it. With a new year now upon us, we'd like to take a moment to look back at the year that was 2014. This past year in sports saw many great moments as well as plenty more forgettable ones. In early February, what many thought will be a matchup for the ages turned out to be a heavily one-sided affair as the NFC champion Seattle Seahawks dominated the favored Denver Broncos in the 48th edition of the Super Bowl, taking the big game by a score of 43-8. Amid fears of terrorist attacks and protests against Russia's anti-gay propaganda, the Winter Olympics took place in Sochi. Despite all the controversy surrounding the event, nothing could slow down the Canadian men's hockey team who dominated their opponents easily, winning the gold medal. Brazil hosted the World Cup with high hopes of winning it all. The entire nation then watched as their home team suffered a crushing defeat at the hands of the eventual champions from Germany. And who can forget the play of the Los Angeles Kings in the 2014 Stanley Cup playoffs? Not only did they come back from a three-game deficit against the San Jose Sharks, they also won two other seven-game series before beating the New York Rangers to win the Stanley Cup. For all the great moments, 2014 was not lacking in controversy, especially in the NFL. After video emerged of Ray Rice knocking his then fiance out cold, the issue of domestic violence took center stage. The situation got worse when future Hall of Fame running back Adrian Peterson was accused of physically abusing his four-year-old son. Just as forgettable was former Los Angeles Clippers owner Donald Sterling blatant racist remarks which were made public and promptly forced him to sell his team and received a lifetime ban from the NBA. The St. Louis Rams made a statement as six of their players came out of the dressing room with their hands raised up in the air as homage to Mike Brown, who was unarmed and have said to have his hands raised in surrender when he was shot and killed by police. Through all the good and all the bad, 2014 had no shortage of stories in the world of sports. We saw enormous victories as well as crushing defeats. We saw athletes rise to greatness and some fall from grace. All in all, it was a special year, one we will not soon forget. Here's to a new year one that will hopefully be as unforgettable as the last. For everyone here, we'd like to wish you a great 2015. And as always, we ask you to read between the lines. Adam Reed's wardrobe by carp.ca. Salon services courtesy of Glamatelier La Maison de Beauté. Guest accommodations provided by Holiday Inn Express and Suites. Catering services by Piatto Rustico, available at piattorustico.com.